Hello and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host Jeffrey Augustine. On today's show we welcome back Mark Fisher for part two of David Miscavige's Rise to Power. We begin in the year 1982. Uh, the year is 1982, and I'm up at the Int base again. And what had happened was I was that pulled up there. They decided that the evaluation approval line really needed to be up in this new organization called Religious Technology Center, RTC. Okay, and that was the first time I'd ever heard of the RTC. But they decided that since RTC was going to be in charge of the trademarks and the and the um, uh, policing of the trademarks of Scientology and Dianetics, that the approval needed to be in RTC as well. So I got pulled up there to set up my own unit up there in um, at the Int Base, okay? And that at the time, Steve Marlowe was the inspector, Deputy Inspector General. Annie Broker was the Inspector General, but she held that post over, you know, with L. Ron Hubbard, wherever he was in hiding. Um, but Steve Marlowe was the Deputy Inspector General, and then Vicki Asnaran was, uh, was there as well, and she was my senior at the time. Anyway, so I was put there, to, and I started bringing people up and putting the unit together there. Uh, David Miscavige at that time, uh, you know, author services had been set up at that time um, as a for-profit organization. And here's the funny thing about, you know, David Miscavige isn't stupid. He follows his money. He follows the money himself, too. Uh, you know, since author services was going to be for profit, all the staff members that went over there had to be paid like a regular employee, and not Sea Org wages of seventeen dollars and twenty cents a week. So you know they had to resign, I guess, the Sea Org, and they all moved over there and all that. Well, <laughs> and they were going to get bonuses based off of how much money they made for L. Ron Hubbard. Well, guess what? David Miscavige ain't going to miss out on that. So not only does he keep his position as that special projects operator over that. He moves over and becomes the chairman of the board of, of author services, uh, a for-profit organization, and starts making huge bonuses and stuff off of all the money that they're raping and pillaging from Scientology, as well as the, the book sale, uh, you know, fiascos and, you know, the, the different scams they had going on books and all that sort of stuff. Anyway, but that's where he, he, he was after the money, so he took both positions. He was the chairman of board of author services, and in the Scientology, he was a special project operator. Mark, this uh, explains a lot about David Miscavige. A couple of reasons. In, in, in and around 82, with the creation of Author Services International, and what that means for, for our listeners who, who aren't familiar, Author Services International is the literary agency for L. Ron Hubbard. They represent the author while he's alive. Therefore, the author must receive royalties. And in some way, would it be correct to say that the entire Scientology enterprise is premised upon the fact that the author must receive royalties? Yes, but you know, over the years, previously, L. Ron Hubbard said, oh no, I donated my royalties back to the church. But now it became where it was imperative that he had to make royalties on the books that were sold within the church, as well as his fiction works that he was selling you know, uh, through bookstores, you know, the Battlefield Earth, Mission Earth, and all that stuff. So the scriptures of the church become non-profit, and then his, his fiction becomes for-profit, but ASI is the overall managing agent of his literary works. David Miscavige is smart for this reason. He, he chooses what's really important to L. Ron Hubbard, the money and the intellectual properties. Whereas Pat Broker stays on the ranch and handles the ranch, which is not important once Mr. Hubbard dies. Right. So David Miscavige has positioned himself at ASI. He's chairman of the board, Author Services International. On paper, then, the commanding officer, Commodore's Messenger Organization, Int, or what's called COCMO Int, should be the highest post on the org board underneath L. Ron Hubbard himself. That and, and the executive director, International, EDN. Okay, so and that was Bill so Franks at the time. Miscavige really kicks out Gail Irwin and he puts in John Nelson. So Miscavige is effectively running CMO through a puppet. Absolutely, because he, he's the one who reported and got rid of. I mean, that's what I was saying. You know, David Miscavige wasn't the most senior person in the Commodore's Messenger Org. Dee Dee Riesbordorf as COCMO Int, and then Gail Irwin as COCMO Int, they were his seniors. And as a matter of fact, they thought that he was acting up, but he realized that he was in charge of the communication line between Pat Broker and Scientology because Gail, you know, the only way that 
uh, communication could get to L. Ron Hubbard was by courier, and they had to be done very surreptitiously. It was done late at night, and it was done in weird places where people would go meet Pat Broker, and they would exchange boxes, uh, and then off they would go, right? Well, Gail didn't want to do that. She didn't realize how important it was, so Dave Miscavige volunteered. And of course, he and Pat Broker were buddy buddies anyway. <laughs> and this is this is where the this is where this is, your decisions come back to haunt you later because you know that decision put him in control of the communication lines. And so effectively, because Gail didn't feel like driving, you know, to an IHOP in Tulare or San, San Bernardino or wherever it was, uh, uh, Devor. Yeah. You know, what I mean, there were different places that they would go meet. Uh, David Miscavige would go meet with Pat Broker and do these courier runs in a black Chevy van that originally was made for L. Ron Hubbard, um, actually by John Brousseau, and then uh, I think I think if I'm right on that, and then uh, but uh, he never got around to using it because he wasn't at the base, so you know it was taken over, and that was what was used for the ran used used for the runs on the couriering. So Dave's uh, David Miscavige is in a black Chevy van. It's interesting that Gail Irwin didn't realize get what giving up that that duty of becoming a courier meant. Well, she realized it later because what happened was is that all of a sudden she was getting suspicious because David Miscavige was acting uh, he, was, he was acting out against her and against other executives that were his senior. Like he wasn't listening to them, he was doing what he wanted, he basically was telling them to, you know, to F off, you know what I mean? Because uh, he's doing, you know, his special project, special unit, and all that sort of stuff himself, and so screw you guys, you know what I mean? And that, that they got upset about it. That usually meant in Scientology this, that you've got uh, committed crimes, overts, or withholds, you know what I mean? In other words, you've got done transgressions against the group. So what they did was is they, they ordered – they got a hold of David Mayo, and we're talking to David Mayo, who was the senior CS international, and they, they told him, we want David Miscavige brought in for a security check for, you know, like uh, for his, you know, find out what is he up to. You know what I mean? What are his crimes? What's he up to? And that started the whole ball rolling about, against David Miscav or David Mayo uh, – because what happened was is that David Miscavige was brought in for sec checking, and a bunch of stuff was found out about him and Pat doing things. You know, apparently this is this is secondhand, but basically doing things apparently when they were out doing their career things they should have been doing, and that they, you know when these reports were found out, they didn't want him. Pat Brooker didn't want him going to L. Ron Harvard, so he intercepted him, and next thing you know, Gail Irwin is toast. She's out. <laughs> You know what I mean? So really, yeah. <laughs> it's just like, no, this ain't happening. You're out. You know, so she was out, and they put in John Nelson, who was the puppet, you know, the next puppet in charge. So Miscavige effectively has control of uh, CMO at that point. How does the purge of David Mayo happen? Well, I was there at the time, like I said, setting up the authorization, verification, and correction unit. And I, I had to interact with David Mayo because technical issues would come through and that type of thing. And I go see him in his, in his office, and I thought it was really strange because he would kind of talk in innuendo about how things aren't as they actually appear – uh, in management, in terms of who's in charge and what's going on, and he knew what was going on, you know what I mean? Um, and he would always, like, you know, sort of intimate that, you know, that there's going to be changes, things are going on here, but basically saying that, you know, mis miscavige and stuff, that that's all going to get cleaned up. Well, it turned out to be the other way around because what happened is a bunch of reports got sent up to L. Ron Hubbard about David Mayo, and it's out, out tech, and, or, uh, you know, things that he'd done and crimes that he committed to the point where uh, David Miscavige got an order from uh, L. Ron Hubbard to remove David Mayo in his entire office, and that's when they were put down doing you know, heavy labor and then eventually started running around a tree, which is the beginning of the running program. Anyway, that's, that's, they, they all got busted you know, as criminals, traitors to L. Ron Hubbard. I mean, the blackest of black marks against David Mayo, a man who saved L. Ron Hubbard's life a few years earlier at W when L. Ron Hubbard had a stroke and got him through, and now all of a sudden he's he's the biggest uh, criminal that's ever been next to the people in the GO. But doesn't this speak to you? Does this speak to L. Ron Hubbard's ability to betray people? Well, exactly. Now, since I've left Scientology at the time, I kept thinking, this is crazy. I'm thinking, I'm, I, I, this is what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, this doesn't make sense. This isn't logical. He's got to be getting 
false reports. Because L. Ron Hubbard always preached in management a, a multiple viewpoint system. Don't ever rely on one source of information. Get multiple sources of information, and then you can weed out what's true and what's not. If you want to know something, verify it with a separate source. That's how we were trained as managers. But yet he wasn't doing that. He was just taking a single source line communication. And I'm thinking, why is he doing that? That's completely contrary to what he taught us as managers, L. Ron Hubbard, right? And I'm going, this is crazy. He's got to be getting false information. And the same thing happened at the same time where um, Bill Franks was removed and then a, a the, the guy who was in charge of the management unit down in Florida is a, a man named Kerry Gleason, who was the best manager that Scientology had. He, hands down, he knew what he was doing. He was expanding organizations, had been for years. He becomes the executive director international, and they start getting all these crazy orders from management from based on reports that were being sent to L. Ron Hubbard to the point where they decide down separately down Clearwater that L. Ron Hubbard's getting false reports, and we need to maybe find out where he's at so we can get him the true data. And what happened was is that they were looking into finding the Rome Pinkerton men or private investigators to go find L. Ron Hubbard so that they could get the data directly to him. And of course that then became these people are traitors, they're trying to get L. Ron Hubbard and thought, you know, David Miscavige blew up about the whole thing. They all got busted. They all got brought up to the international base on the premise of coming to a meeting and then they were not allowed to leave. They basically were being held prisoner there. Bill Franks was held prisoner out, out in a shack for a long time. I mean, they were basically held prisoner, and they were removed, you know, and they were basically shit-canned, you know, for history. Uh, so what happened at that time, and then, then it was like, okay, well, now we need to put out to the world that these guys are criminals. So what happened was that in Scientology, they have what's called a committee of evidence, which is a justice action. It'd be like if you had to go to court in the, in the, in the U.S. or district court or whatever. But in Scientology, we, they had their own internal justice. So it was decided that these people needed to get a committee of evidence before they were declared suppressive people because they were big names. And we're talking David Mayo, Bill Franks, Kerry Gleason, Peter Warren, yada, 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 on down the line. These people were the ones that, that, were, that were the face of Scientology to so many Scientologists. So a, a committee of evidence was drawn up in like September or October of 82, and I was made a member of the jury. You know how in, in a committee of evidence Please, you have yeah. to have the jury to, to basically listen to the charges and evidence and decide these people's fate. Well, I'm on the jury along the, – the chairman was Ray Mitoff, Jesse Prince was on there, I was on there, and a couple other people, right? Well, I knew these people because I dealt with them as managers down in Clearwater going, we were booming, man. We were kicking it, man. They, were, they knew what the hell they're doing. Why are they on the – I mean, L. Ron Hubbard must be getting false information. Well, during this committee of evidence, these people were all up there, right? I was getting auditing, and this was coming up in my sessions about – well, you know, what's wrong? And I'm going like, I think this thing is uh, is wrong. I mean, these people should not be being, you know, tried and this and that and da 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 da. The evidence is not there. Well, guess what? Those knowledge re knowledge reports would be written up from those sessions, and they were given to David Miscavige and to Steve Marlowe and these people. And I was, it was decided that I was disaffected with Scientology and Scientology management, so I was removed from post and subsequently immediately sent to the Rehabilitation Project Force and shipped out to PAC. <laughs> it was a kangaroo court. I mean, they, they basically, it was, there was no justice in this thing, you know, and they, the people all eventually, they all got declared and booted out of Scientology to this day, you know. And dur now during that period, Alan Walter, who was a big mission holder back then, he told me when he was alive and that 35,000 people left the Church of Scientology in this era where there was the mission holder massacre and all the big names like David Mayo leaving, mm -hmm. Do you remember 35,000 people thereabouts leaving the church? Well, it was a large number. I don't know what the amount was, but see, what happened was is that then created an enemy. See, I mean, look, at we were talking about L. Ron Hubbard. You know, I, after leaving, I realized that the guy was a paranoid schizophrenic. I mean, all throughout his history, from the 50s all the way through, his best friends would then become his biggest traitorous enemies. I saw it through, you know, reading Russell Miller's book, reading all this stuff. So... And that was the way it seemed to me, too. I couldn't understand why somebody could be really great, like David Mayo, and then all of a sudden he's the worst person ever. It just didn't make any sense to me. As just a human being, I just went, that doesn't make any sense. But, but, but he, he would demonize these people. Well, guess what? They made their own enemies because then what did David Mayo and Alan 
Uh, John Nelson, John Nelson was included in that comment too, the guy who was the CO, CMO in. He was shit can too. They go off and they start the Advanced Ability Center in Santa Barbara delivering Scientology services. You had the John Ziegel tapes. Yes, yeah. And, and, I, and I remember getting a John Ziegel tape, and they were selling like $50 in the Scientology Underground. Mm -hmm. There was a, a sort of an early independent group over by the old Vans Bakery in L.A., and uh, I got one from a guy named Roland, and I remember putting it in and hearing about all this stuff going on, and at the same time, I got wind of the fact that the, the Office of Special Affairs, the Scientology police, were going around L.A. and other New York, other places, scouring the earth for these John Ziegel tapes and destroying them. So you had this this big movement of disaffected Scientologists. David Mayo is a prominent figure. All the extraordinary leaders of Scientology have been, you know, purged. What happens when you go to RPF? How long are you in RPF? Well, that's, that's what, that was the first time I really had doubts about Scientology and thought about leaving. Okay, I, um, I, November 1982, I was signed to the RPF, and I was, I was shipped out to, to the Big Blue out in L.A., uh, the Cedar sinai place, and then I was put in an RPF there, and I immediately wanted to leave. I immediately wanted to run. I went, this is, this is BS. I mean, this is crazy. It's nuts. What am I doing here, you know? And um, after a few days of that, I actually got handled to stay, and, and then I, I got twinned up with somebody, you know, who um, was actually Stacy Young, Stacy Brooks, uh, famous Stacy Young, Bond, and Stacy Young. Right. Um, Stacy had been assigned to the RPF uh, from ASI, Author Services, and uh, we were matched up and we were twinned up together. And um, when you start taking responsibility for somebody else, your problems then become not so great. Anyway, to make a long story short, I decided to stay. And um, that I was in the uh, rehabilitation project force. Only not that long. I mean, back in the day, back in those days, it wasn't considered that you were in there for very long. I mean, literally, I was in there from November, and I think I graduated in April of 83. You know what I mean? So what is that, like four, like six months, you know? And that was considered, you know, and, and, and I got through the running program during that. I had to do the running. I was on one of the first people on the running program. I did that for 51 days in Griffith Park. And uh, anybody who, who was assigned to the RPF from the IT base had to do the running program in order to graduate. And that, that was a pilot. They were piloting at the time. So I did that. And then I, um, you know, she and I sec checked each other and, you know, and, and that type of thing. And I already had some auditor training. So did she. So we moved faster than most people did. But we eventually did. We, we got done, and then we had to wait for our graduations uh, uh, to be approved. And we had to wait weeks because it had to be approved by uh, Steve Marlowe and then David Miscavige, and they took their sweet time. But all during that time when I was in the RPF is when the raids of terror by the International Finance Police were going on with Wendell Reynolds and Don Larson, where they were going in and they were knocking down the, the mission holders and stripping them of all their money, and this reign of terror was going, going on during that time period, and Scientology was suffering big time. But of course, the money coming to L. Ron Hubbard and to Scientology, or the Sea Org, was great because they were just ripping it off from these places, meanwhile decimating the Scientology mission network, you know? And this is all to L. Ron Hubbard's financial game, but it also allows David Miscavige to cons begin to consolidate his power. Correct. Now, now, so what happened was then, I then graduate, we graduated from the RPF, and at that time, the first project we had to do was Author Services was renovating, they, they had offices at that time on Sunset, 6464 Sunset Boulevard, and they were going to renovate their office spaces to make them more nice and, and presentable for, you know, as a, you know, uh, representing L. Ron Hubbard. So they needed people to oversee that renovation. They used they were going to use the rehabilitation project force to do the renovations at night, but they picked me and a couple other people to do the logistics. We had to do the purchasing and get everything there and take care of that sort of thing. And it was run by Terry Gamboa, who also, she had been the executive director of Author Services, and she had been removed a few months before that and was on the running program with us. Anyway, so she picked us, and then we ended up I ran the logistics on getting that uh, space renovated, and that's when I ran into David Miscavige all the time because he act I would actually see him there in, in author services at that time. He was almost full-time there. And um, so that's where I, I got in the good graces again was on that project. And, and what did Miscavige do? Did he move you back into your old position? What happened after I finished that, then I was sent back to Clearwater, back to be in charge of authorization, verification, and correction, handling the approval of, of evaluations and management thing. Again, that lasted for about two months, and then I was pulled back up to 
um, uh, RTC to be an ABC Int, uh, ABC International, under Vicki Asneran. At this point, Steve Marlowe had been removed, and Vicki Asneran was in charge with Jesse Prince. And I was brought back up there because I was the best person at handling all that stuff, you know. So I was brought up there, and I, I was only up there, I, I think I, I – I came back to Int like in September of 83, and by mid-November, an, an order comes down from L. Ron Hubbard to DM as the chairman of the board of ASI as part of the corporate sort out to set up a liaison office in Scientology that author services could use to basically funnel traffic through. So in other words, author services had interest in Scientology churches because they sell books, LRH's image, all that sort of thing, and the legal, everything. So in order to maintain corporate integrity, they figured they'd put up the shell organization, and L. Ron Hubbard came up with the idea. It was called the Corporate Liaison Office, right, whereby they, we would have opposite number of people. So, like, for instance, Marty was in charge of legal and ASI at that time, author services. Well, then I had a, somebody that I, I got in Scientology that he could use to, to handle things for him if need be through, through OSA, right? And then I was in charge of, the, of dealing with the gold. Since I was located up at the base, I would deal with anything having to do with Golden Era Productions or CMO International or the exec strata, that type of thing. And I actually set up a whole office. Now, L. Ron Hubbard wrote this thing to David Miscavige as a facility differential. And what that means is that when an executive you know, takes on lots of jobs, in Scientology they call it a facility differential where they give them a staff to ease their load and ease their burden. And so basically the corporate liaison office was set up as a facility differential or to ease David Miscavige's burden as COB ASI as well as special project ops in the church. For all intents and purposes, David Miscavige and L. Ron Hubbard continued to order into the church regardless of the corporate structure. But this was basically the facade that was set up and then staff was put there. And then I, I was responsible also for David Miscavige's laundry, his cleaning, his food, you know, his office, everything. I, I it was uh, set up that way and I, I built a team of about seven people. And I was asked if I wanted to do this in November 1976. Uh, Vicki Asneran asked me if I wanted to do this. And I said, well, I guess so. I mean, I like what I'm doing, but if, if it's needed, I'll do it. And so then I had to meet with David Miscavige. And uh, I had not really worked for David Miscavige, you know, since we were 16, and other than just having interaction with him from time to time, and then on the ASI project where I was doing the renovation. And he asked me, he said, are you tough enough to do this? And I said, yes, sir. And I said, okay, great. And so he took me on, and, and that's how I got started on that position. And then I was in that position, uh, you know, then for the next six years. So you were David Miscavige's assistant. Was, would, would this be the equivalent of L. Ron Hubbard's household unit? Uh, both. It would be his household unit as well as the messengers on duty. You know what I mean? The, the messengers who were basically there with him at all times and making sure that his orders got complied with. You know what I mean? Uh, the, so you're you're running both uh, his household unit and his own personal CMO. Plus also had other other CMO messengers who were responsible for Lyman Spurlock and, uh, and uh, Marty Rathman in legal affairs for ASI. I had uh, another guy who worked with me up at the end base, Jason Benick. Who, who also worked with me in ha dealing with gold, you know, with, uh, with uh, the movies and the sound and the audio. Because what happened was is David Miscavige was spending most of his time in L.A., but then he had responsibilities up at the base because um, while they were working on the all-clear for L. Ron Hubbard legally to be able to come back to the base, the base was not ready for L. Ron Hubbard to come back to be able to produce his movies and do the audio work and that type of thing. So he needed somebody there, which was me, to oversee the projects, to build the, the audio studio, to get the, the, the um, uh, uh, film crew built up and trained and ready to go, to get all the audio lines set up, the recording, the mixing lines, the audio lines, the this or that. And so that became my function and duty so that he could then send me an uh, uh, email because we, we, at this point, computers were becoming more rudimentary. He could send me a message and tell me what he wanted done, and then I would go and take care of it. What is uh, David Miscavige like in these days? He he has his fingers in a lot of pies. I mean, does he get up at noon, as has been said? No. What happens is he go. That's that. That's the disadvantage of working for him. Um, you know, like we were on a schedule where we were up, you know, uh, eight o'clock in the morning, and and you know had to be at breakfast by nine, or nine, and and then study after that, and then you we would work until like eleven, eleven thirty at night, and supposed to go to bed. Well, he would get up whenever the heck he wanted, but then he would work till two, three, four in the morning. 
Well, we were expected to stay up until he went to bed, but then we still had to be up at 9 o'clock in the morning, whereas he'd just sleep and, and get up whenever he wanted to. Um, and I just funny stories about, I mean, I had, we, we were, resp- I was, we were responsible for waking him up in the morning. Mark, what's involved in waking up David Miscavige in the morning? Well, our office, we were in the, what's called the villas at the international base. They were these low motel units that were right along the highway. And the lower villa was birthing. That's where, where the senior executives like David Miscavige, that's where they lived. Right. And then the middle one, that was where the RTC offices were, and that's where um, uh, uh, David Miscavige had his office. And then the upper villa was L. Ron Hubbard spaces. He had his office there, had his film and equipment, his communication center, and all that was in the upper villa. Anyway, so it, it, to wake up David Miscavige, it could be like 10, 11, 30, whatever. First thing he had to do was he had to call his phone. He had he had a um, phone, you know, like a phone line right next to his bed. It wasn't an internal phone. It was an external phone. And you have to wake him up, and you have to say, sir, it's time to get up. Okay, thanks. And hang up. You wait 10 minutes, then you call him again. Sir, it's time to get up. Okay, great. Thanks. Hang up. <laughs> During that time, you've put coffee on, and you've got his cup of coffee ready. So after that second time you've called, your job is to then go down and actually walk into his bedroom with Shelly and him sleeping in their bed, walk around his bed, put the coffee down on his end table, and then lightly put your hand on his back and start going, sir, sir, it's time to wake up. It's time to wake up. And Jason Benick used to do it, and DM would bolt up, and it would jar him out of his sleep, and that pissed him off no end. So I had to basically go, sir, it's time to get up. It's time to get up. Your coffee's right here. At that point, he would wake up, get his coffee, and then uh, I said, what? He always, it was always was like, what's happening? You know, I mean, just like the guy in office space, like, hey, uh, what's happening? You know, he want to know what's the latest, you know, like anything happened while I was asleep. And then I turn around and then I had to go back to the office. Now, Marty said that uh, he had to be briefed immediately. But when you're in waking up going, sir, it's time to wake up, sir, it's time yeah. to wake up. Were you the one we said, okay, what's going on? Are you the one that gives him the first morning action report? If there's something, but he'd be asking about things that I was involved in with him at the gold base. So then I would tell him if there was something important that had changed overnight. Well, what's an example? What, well, what's like an example? Instance, let's say, let's say they were trying to get, uh, you know, um, uh, a mix done for him, you know, on uh, some lectures and they were staying up all night to do it. You know, I, first thing he goes, what's happening? I say, sir, they got the, they got the, uh, the mix done on that Philadelphia doctor court lecture. It's on your desk. You know what I mean? Something like that. That's just an example. No, this is a, this is an interesting tidbit. So then, so he gets up, he has his coffee, he's up out of bed. Uh, does he, does like he take a shower and then go into his yeah, office? Yeah, he takes a shower. And I mean, you, 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 we wouldn't see him necessarily for another 25, you know, 30, 45 minutes. And then he'd come walking up, go into his office and shut his door. We had connecting, our offices were connecting with a sliding door between them. And, uh, and he would slide the door shut because at that point then I guess he would call Marty over or whatever and, and um, you know, find out what was going on with the legal stuff and all that. We, I, I was never privy to any of that stuff. So Marty would give him his secret briefing. Right. Almost like and almost then, like the president getting his national security briefing first thing in the morning. <laughs> well, come on, this is chairman of the board. This is the ecclesiastical <laughs> leader of the Scientology religion. He needs a briefing on the world situation. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so he gets a briefing. Uh, it, he has breakfast, I guess. Yeah, well, breakfast was lunch for him. You know what I mean. And then we would, you know, we'd muster up after that. Now, now this it was different at different times because. Prior to him moving into RTC, Religious Technology Center, in 87 or 88, whatever it was, when he was just special project ops, what would happen then was he wasn't there for weeks on end. He would come up a weekend a month, if that. Sometimes, you know, every other weekend, sometimes once a month just for the weekend. And he'd come up on a Friday night and he'd leave on a Sunday, um, Sunday after he woke up. And so, to be honest with you, people will tell you, that was when the international base was running the smoothest because he wasn't there sticking his finger in everybody's face and in and, and everybody's pie. They could actually do their jobs without him walking through the area and issuing a ton of orders and disrupting everything. But uh, the, the goal that we used to have when I was in charge of his corporate liaison office was when he was coming up for the weekend, we wanted a completely flat, free, smooth weekend. We made sure there were lots of submissions for him to look at. We made sure the base was immaculate. We would follow the route that he would take because we didn't want anybody getting in any trouble. 
because, you know, when they got in trouble, then we would get in trouble, you know. So we had it down to where he was driving. Him and Shelly would be driving up to the base. We would get alerted when they left PAC, and then we knew we had 90 minutes. And then, and then when the security guards, when they said he's driving through the gate, we would be out in the parking lot, cup of coffee in hand, ready to, to empty his car and bring it up. You know, it was just basically trying to make it as seamless and smooth, smooth as possible. Mark, is David Miscavige as horrible of a micromanager as they say? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, there's a, such a thing in Scientology management policy called uh, the, uh, creating a danger condition, meaning any time a, a senior executive, probably in corporate, same thing would happen too, where, you, you know, in corporate, like let's say your corporate executive bypasses bypasses two people below him and goes directly to somebody and starts issuing orders and starts changing things and ignoring those executives that he has between them, that's called danger. That's a danger condition. Those people are in danger of losing their jobs because this guy's gone past them. Well, he, sure. Well, it, sometimes it's necessary to do that when people are messing up. But he constantly was creating danger conditions by constantly going and he would ignore everybody. He didn't care. He'd go all the way down to the cook in the galley or he'd go to the, you know, to the, the film crew and this and that. And he just would issue orders left, right, you know what I mean? And uh, we'd be there taking him down. At the time, we didn't record his orders like these people do now with tape recorders. You know what I mean? I basically would go with him and I would get the gist of what he wanted done. And then I would write it down. And then, then after he left, then it was my job to make sure that stuff got taken care of. And I did. I, I made sure that stuff got taken care of. As a matter of fact, you know, I mean, my reputation was is that I, I was the good cop. I was the soft hand. I mean, I, I never yelled at anybody, ever. I never yelled at anybody. Um, but he would blow up, and then I was the one that would come in there and go, okay, you know, Jeff, let's, let's figure out how we can get this done. You know what I mean? And I would logically go through, and he liked that. You know what I mean? So for David Miscavige to counter order, cross order, bypass, it's a, it's a mess. It really is. It's just it's well, it's, imagine it's, unknown. That it's, it's it's happening all the time, and so therefore it's always turmoil. When he so when he was there full time after he he moved into RTC, it was turmoil every day. Nobody could do their job. Everybody was being removed from positions. People who had had the job for years all of a sudden were were taken off, you know, and just at his whim. You know what I mean? Um, He's hard to deal with because, you know, first of all, you're always afraid that he's going to blow up. So people are in fear of even just talking to him. And then you get, the, you get the, the phenomena that happened after I left the base, but that Mike Rinder describes as people getting pie face. He used to call it pie face. I, I, he didn't call it that in those days, where they just would be wide-eyed not say anything because they're afraid anything that they said he would jump on, right? He hated that too. But what made it even worse in those days is he used to wear these mirrored sunglasses that the astronauts wore, where they were like <laughs> orange, fluorescent yeah. orange, you know, tinted glasses where you could not see his eyes. And I don't know if he did that on purpose or what, but literally he could say something and you would take him seriously when he was kidding. And the reason you couldn't tell is because you couldn't see his eyes. Do you know what I mean? No, or would there be something that. where you think he's joking and then he would just explode, you know? Well, mirror and sunglasses were kind of a head game, a sight game, mm -hmm. and and uh, they were very popular with police officers when they came out. So they, they would do a traffic stop, or you know, detectives would be talking to a suspect, and you couldn't get the reaction. So for David Miscavige to wear mirror and sunglasses is just so indicative of the personality type. Absolutely, and I'm telling you, I, I'm telling you, it, uh, people don't remember this, but I mean, he would wear these things, and I don't know if he did it on purpose or not, but literally, you could not tell. He, he'd crack a joke, and you were thinking he was serious, and he'd go like, why aren't you laughing? Yeah, I mean, I, he, he didn't understand the reaction, you know? No, it's just such an odd thing. Mark, you were telling me that David Miscavige has an extensive collection of guns. Yeah, that's the other thing, too. I mean, they talk about guns. I know Jackson mentioned the guns and security. I, I, I wasn't privy to the security aspect in terms of that sort of thing, right? But, uh, but David Miscavige, well, first of all, L. Ron Hubbard had an extensive gun collection, okay? And then David Miscavige did, too. I don't know if he, had, if he was into guns before he got into the Sea Org or not, but, I mean, I was responsible for taking care of a lot of his guns. Um, but he had extensive gun collection. As a matter of fact, he used to get them for his birthday. Um, I asked him one time, I mean, some of the guns he had, like he, he had a Mini-14, which is like a semi-automatic weapon. And then one year for his birthday, he got a, um, a, 
uh, AR-15, which is the military version of the M-16, which is semi-auto. And then he, his, then he got this Israeli assault rifle called a Galil, and that was his favorite gun, his, his Galil. I asked him one time, what's your favorite gun? He said the Galil, the Israeli assault rifle. Um, but he, they used to joke, you know, because I didn't have guns, but uh, he said, you need to get a gun. And him and the other executives, they would get guns, and they were like, you need to have a gun. I said, why? And they go, well, who's going to defend the place when the when when the mutant zombies come over the fence? You know what I mean? I mean they were joking, but still, it was kind of like you know you need it for defense, you know. And, uh, and and yeah, Jackson Jackson Moore had related a story of there was an intruder on the base. Yeah. Jackson, you know, gets a gun, but then all the executives come out with their guns. Well, DM had a thirty-eight. He had a loaded thirty-eight in his desk drawer. He had he had like a little snub nose thirty-eight. You know what I mean? He had it in his in his right hand drawer of his office. Well, there you go. I mean, he had that, but I mean, he, he had. I remember he had he had a Walther PPK, which was the James Bond gun. I liked that gun. He had he had a forty five. You know what I mean? Then one time he got he had he had somebody buying this this target pistol called a Thompson Contender with a sight on it, and that that gun. Anytime he got a gun, he'd go out. We'd go shooting, and literally we'd shoot into just into the mountainside. You know what I mean? Uh, one time I've told this story before, but one time um, uh, he had shotguns. Right? He had twelve gauge shotguns. He got he got an over and under shotgun for his for his birthday once, a beautiful Italian shotgun. I mean, he had tons of guns. But one time we were up at 6 o'clock in the morning and he got in a new shotgun, and somebody from the Golden Era base had put a no parking zone sign, a wooden sign, across from the par across the parking lot from his office with an embankment behind it. And he goes, I hate that sign. So they went outside with the shotguns, and they just blew the crap out of that sign at 6 o'clock in the morning <laughs> with the shotguns. You know what I mean? Uh, he, they took turns now, shooting at it. A question for you. You mentioned earlier that L. Ron Hubbard had a large gun collection. I don't think that's well known at all. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he did. Sonar, actually. Sonar Parman used to take care of it. And uh, But, yeah, there was a gun room. And then Rick Asneran, when he was a safety officer, head of security, he took care of it. But, yeah, they had a... Um, there was a hole up in the upper villa that I mentioned. There was one room that was basically his gun room where there was a place where you could clean guns. And he had like a Thompson machine gun and, you know, different different guns, you know, that were put on the, you know, that were um, displayed, you know, like in a display case, you know. Sure. L. Ron Hubbard had a Thompson submachine gun? Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's what it looked like. I never saw it fired if it was a real machine gun or not, but that was that. I mean, it, I mean that's, so, that's so typically Hubbard. You know, that's kind of a, like a 1930s gangster machine gun. Yeah. Well, well listen, I want to tell you something. I want to tell you something. I mean, the guns were so – with security, like, like I never saw – I saw Pat Broker two times in, when he was in hiding with L. Ron Hubbard. Two times I saw him. The first time I saw him, he had a full beard, a full head of hair. I didn't even recognize him. He was jumping out of the van because he would come to the base every once in a while, and you would just see the silver van. It was called the silver van. You'd see the silver van, but you wouldn't see him because he'd, he'd duck into his his uh, his bedroom. And he had a whole suite, or he'd be up in the uh, the communication center where, where, where they took care of uh, transcribing all of L. Ron Hubbard's orders and stuff, and he'd be up there. But one time, the silver van pulled up. And I, I just happened to be walking down a walkway. And he comes jumping out of the side of the silver van, and he's got a Uzi. He's got a Uzi with him. <laughs> what and he is goes he running up to the comm center with the Uzi. And I, that's all I saw. I didn't <laughs> see him again. You know what I mean? So I knew they were serious about protecting LRH's location, and they, they, they were packing. On the gun thing, like I remember one birthday when he got the Galil, the Israeli assault rifle, we, we had a big birthday party for him in Dana Point on a, on a yacht, you know what I mean, out, you know, cruising for the day, and he got the Galil and he was able to shoot it off the boat, you know, out in the water. Um, I had photographs of these of him with these shooting guns, but of course when I left Scientology, finally all my photographs were confiscated, but I wish I had them now. Um, but the other aspect with the guns, Tom Cruise, you know, when, when I was there when DM first met Tom Cruise, and then just, just to get into the gun aspect of it, the, DM took Tom Cruise up to the rifle range. There was a rifle range behind the Bonneview house for L. Ron Hubbard to use for skeet shooting and then also for target practice. And DM thought that that would be great. We'll bring Tom Cruise up there and we'll go shooting. And that was the first time I met Tom Cruise was on a motorbike as he came motorbiking up to the, the – um, the uh, rifle range. Well, the rifle range was a simple little pad, you know, the simple little concrete slab up against the mountainside where you, where you could shoot and not hit anybody, you know, because I mean? you're shooting against the mountain. And we right. had this little handheld, you know, you know, uh, skeet machine, you know, the clay pigeons where somebody would somebody would pull a string when they called pull, right? Anyway, so so 
Tom Cruise had uh, DM told me after that day. He said, "You know, Tom Cruise is a little bit afraid of guns. I had to show him how to use them." I said, "You kidding me? I saw him in movies. He said those were always fake guns. He'd just never really been around guns." So DM was showing him how to use the different guns and stuff. Anyway, next thing we know, before Tom Cruise comes the next next visit, he sends a present to DM of an automated skeet and clay pigeon machine. You know that would automatically sh shoot the thing. How deluxe? That's kind of a rich guy's toy. Right. Well, so the DM is like going, oh, my God, he's going to be here this weekend. We've got to get this thing set up. So it was an all-night affair with the RPF and the States <laughs> working for two days straight to completely remake the rifle range. They made a bunker to put that thing in underground. They re-landscaped the entire place. They set it all up because they want, he wanted to impress Tom Cruise. And these guys worked around the clock to get that thing set up so that when he came, Mark he'd be impressed. Mark, what is it with David Miscavige wanting to impress Tom Cruise? What's your take on this? Well, I mean, first of all, at that time, he was just trying – he was—he wanted to meet him and basically become buddy buddies. And uh, like I said, one part of David Miscavige's uh, mentality is he's very – there's a couple things. He's very macho in his – he's very like a guy's guy type of thing. He likes football. He likes guns. He likes, you know, he likes hanging with the guys, you know what I mean, telling dirty jokes, that type of thing, right? The other part of it, too, is that he always has to have an entourage with him. He, he's been like that ever since I've known him. He, he never is alone. He, he never – he like when I was – the whole time I was his assistant, I never once saw him and Shelly go out on a day off on their own and go out to dinner together as a couple. They always dragged other people with them. And so Dave's the kind of guy who cannot stand to be alone. He's got to be with a group of people that he can either make fun of or, sh you know what I mean, show up or this or that. You know, he's always got an entourage with him. And Tom Cruise was kind of like that too a little bit, you know what I mean? And so DM was trying to impress him with, you know, you know how quickly he get things done. Oh, you gave me this gift? Look at it. I got this thing already set up for you, you know what I mean? And uh, they also like to drive fast. You know, um, you know Tom Cruise was, was really – I've heard stories about where um, Tom Cruise and DM would be in L.A. and they'd be driving in separate cars and they'd be racing each other down the streets of L.A. in order to try and beat each other to the location they're going to. You mentioned earlier that he's a so David Miscavige is a social climber. Yeah. So, so obviously this would be a reason for him to want to be around Tom Cruise. Correct. Do you see him change at all in the presence of Tom Cruise? Absolutely, because the thing was is that, look, prior to meeting Tom Cruise, the celebrities were dirt, man. And DM's eyes, they were <laughs> they were dilettante. They were they were lazy. They weren't dedicated yeah. like us Sea Org members. They I mean I'm literally, literally true and he'd use more choice language than that, and I'm not the only sure. one who can tell you that. He thought they were lazy, terrible, we're having to handle their cases up here in RTC, they're terrible, they're out ethics, they're this, they're that, blah blah, blah blah blah. A bunch of feedy weedy dilettante. Absolutely. We can't get John Travolta to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know what I mean? I mean, that was his viewpoint, you know what I mean? Well, then, then all yeah. of a sudden, oh, Tom Cruise, Mr. Top Gun, and they get him to come up here to, to the base. All of a sudden, for the first time, I mean, DM has to put on a show. Like, he's like he's a man, you know what I mean? And uh, he they start hanging out together. All of a sudden, DM goes to, you know, Tom Cruise goes, oh, let's, I'm going to the Daytona 500 because we're, we're researching this movie, Days of Thunder, that we're going to be doing. So DM... Is, is in D.C. Uh, with attorneys on something. So he flies down to Daytona Beach for the Daytona 500. Well, he couldn't wait. When he got back to the Imp base, the first thing he does is he called all Mark Rath, Mark, Marty Rathbun, me, Mark Yeager, the different people, Ray Medoff, into his office because he had a videotape. And the videotape was of David Miscavige jumping out of an airplane on one of those tandem skydiving things that right. Tom Cruise got him to do. And we had a videotape of watching DM skydiving. And it was wow. like, this is cool. Wow. You know what I mean? And all of a sudden, it became, you know, DM started rubbing shoulders with Tom Cruise and, you know, all, you know only the best for Tom Cruise. And, and You know what I mean? And, 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 you know, over time, after I left, it got worse, apparently, to the point where, he's fly you know, DM would have never thought of flying on a f private jet. Are you kidding me? Let alone first class when I was there. We still were under budget, you know, in the Sea Org. The IRS was still looming, you know what I mean, in 93. That, you know, that would have never happened. These private jets everywhere and, and, and having, you know, locations where he had an office here and an office there all fully decked. That, none of that happened. That all happened after the IRS stuff.
Mark, that's an interesting observation because I know that, uh, you know, from, from talking to people, David Miscavige used to fly coach, yeah. carry, carry his own luggage. Yeah. He and Marty would share a hotel room. Yep. And it's sort of like he was just one of the guys, like, uh, you know, traveling around in coach. He drove himself when they, when they drove between L.A. and the Gold Base, his 90-minute drive. He drove the car that he had that was assigned to him from the org. You know, and we, well, now, when, when, did, when did the thing start where ASI had to buy him gifts, had to buy him a birthday present? Well, I'm not sure about that, but, but what happened, I was going to mention, you know, I mentioned earlier about how he moved over to ASI because personally he could make more money. They were paying him minimum wage plus huge bonuses based off of L. Ron Hubbard, you know, right. the increase, right? Well, guess what? Once he, when he moved into RTC and reorganized, got rid of Pat Broker and Andy Broker and reorganized, what was the first thing that he did besides the organization board, which I put together? was a bonus right. system for RTC because he was not going to take a pay cut, okay? <laughs> I'm not kidding you. Uh, and so Barbara so Griffin, who's still the Treasury Secretary to this day, from what I understand, is still there making sure that he and Shelley or whatever get paid and get their bonuses. Well, yeah, he's going to uh, butter his own bread, especially if you're in charge. You can do that. So RTC uh, gets lavish pay compared to other CEOs. Right, units. and here's the thing. I mean, this I realize this after the fact too. Is DM likes to he'll commit what are considered crimes, like the fact that he's getting paid more, or going or cutting out on posts and going to the movies whenever he wanted to, or doing this or that whenever he wanted to. But he'd always would bring people with him, so that he could say, well. We all did it. It wasn't just me. You know what I mean? That's why I said it. it was within, yeah, it was in, that's why he always had an entourage. It's like 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, i got to go shopping or whatever. No, no other Sea Org member could do that. You know what I mean? Or go to a movie that night. Nobody else could do that. Or watch television. He had a TV in his room. Nobody else could. That was, they were banned, you know? So, so he would always include other people in it. That way he had other people who say, well, they did it too. Or, or the people that might potentially come after him, they're involved as well. A little bit of air cover. Question for you. It's purely speculative. How? What do you think David Miscavige's net worth is as of 2014? Well, at the time when I was working for him, he was making, between him and Shelley, between their bonuses and their Sea Org pay, I would say they were making around seventy-five, eighty thousand dollars 80000 a year for the two of them. This is in 1990, mm -hmm. 1989, okay. 90, right? But then I think after the IRS thing happened where they had to, the IRS said, you need to pay the top executives, uh, the salary, I think it was 100000 a year or something like that, where certain executives were getting paid that thing, I think he started getting paid more on that. But see, more than that, I mean, he took advantage of after the fact, not at the time. Like when I was there, um, he, he personally invested one time in an oil well when LRH and ASI was investing in those oil wells that, you know, historically they went bust, right? But he, right. he would latch on to these things. Like he would get the Feshbeck brothers, who were notorious short sellers in the stock market, uh, you know, in Scientology. There were Scientologists who were short sellers and were right. multi-millionaires. He would, he would invest his money. This happened after I left, but I've, I've heard stories where he would inv have them invest his money. Of course, he's not taking a loss. You know what I mean? So I can imagine. Of course not. Uh, me personally, I think he's got a couple million dollars at this point. I mean, first of all, he has no expenses. Even his salary is not taxed. And it's all going into savings or into investments. And he's been doing this for 25, 30 years, you know? It's not unthinkable that he, his net worth is in the millions of dollars. No, I agree. Um, one question. Well, let, I, let me go on one further thing, too. Yeah. Back in those days when I was in charge of his office, Yes. Our budget came from CSI. Do you know what I mean? Our budget came from CSI. This is before DM moved into RTC. So we anything that DM wanted to spend or anything like that was scrutinized by the the financial people in CSI. So we had to justify everything. You know what I mean? It wasn't until later when then RTC had their own finances. Same thing. We did a financial planning and all that had to be justified about DM and what he was spending. But I, I think after the fact, once the IRS thing went through, this is just speculation on my part. I just think Katie barred the door. He, he realized he could spend whatever he wanted. It didn't matter. You know what I mean? Nobody was going to say boo to him at that point. Yeah, I, I agree with that, especially after the five-year uh, CTCC, yeah. the probationary period was over yeah. with. Uh, one question that, that gets asked a lot, uh, David Miscavige, do you think that he has an escape plan if should he ever need it? Um, I don't know for a fact, but listen, he's a smart guy. He's cunning and conniving. I would not surprise me. You know, it would not surprise me at all.
I mean, well, I mean, he's yeah. gotten down to the point now where where he doesn't run the man. I mean, he realized over the years that he doesn't need international management. He doesn't need executive end. He doesn't even need gold anymore to do the movies because they use professionals. He, all he needs is the IAS, the International Association of Scientologists regging as much donations as he can and build his war chest and that's all he needs and he can go on camera and say the sky is blue when it's black you know what I mean and they'll listen to him sure. Mark changing gears were you on post when L. Ron Hubbard died yes how did you experience that of the, the loss of L. Ron Hubbard we, um, well we were again I was uh, up at the int base at the time and, and David Miscavige was supposed to come up for the weekend and we got a call this is before it was announced that he had died and uh, it was it was uh, he all of a sudden people started dis Ray Midoff disappeared from the base and there was something was up right and then we got told we all have to go to LA to the Palladium to this event and so we went to, to L.A. to the Palladium, and then when we went to the, in there, and they were playing that really kind of somber music, and right. then Pat Broker came out, then David Miscavige came out, and then Pat Broker, and then we knew we, we knew uh, you know something was wrong. Why did you, as a Sea Org member, feel what happened to the church now with our Hubbard dead? Well, at the time, I mean, of course, we were we were upset. I mean, I, I'll never forget. A DM said, "No, nobody grieved, nobody grieved." You know, and this and that. I'm thinking, God, I mean, it was really, really heavy. But I remember driving back to the Ant base with my wife, and we were discussing. And she was a longtime messenger, and we were both both going like, "Well, at least we'll be able to see Pat and Annie again," you know. And we just assumed it was assumed, you know, because um, shortly thereafter that Lawyer Lawster thing came out, it was assumed that Pat and Annie were going to were going to run things, you know. And at that time, RTC was run by um, uh, Vicki Asnaran and Jesse Prince, and um, and it was just assumed that you know Pat and Annie would be the basically the big bosses. But see, that's what I'm saying. Then shortly thereafter, I started hearing from DM and Norman Starkey, Norman Starkey, who was the executor of L. Ron Hubbard's estate, right. that Pat just wants to continue the horse ranch. And I had to send 23 Sea Org members up there to work at the horse ranch. That was one of my really? first jobs after L. Rich died, was I had to send a bunch of staff up there because he wanted to continue the horse thing. And DM thought that was crazy. And he goes, don't you think that's crazy? And I said, yeah, why would we need a horse ranch? You know what I mean? Would it be fair to say that uh, Pat Broker wanted to be a gentleman rancher on L. Ron Hubbard's money? <laughs> I don't know. I guess so. I, I have no well, idea. Well, no the, re no, the reason I ask is I study this. Pat Broker, if he is to be loyal officer, you know, one and two with his wife Annie, why does he stay on the ranch? Why doesn't he immediately go to Imp Base and take the reins of power? Because I think he was naive as to what David Miscavige had maneuvered underneath him. Um, my personal opinion is David Miscavige, through the attorneys, and two names that I think never get looked into very deeply, but I think are totally responsible is uh, Gerald, Jerry Pfeffer and Monique Yingling. Monique Yingling, who's still his attorney to this day, and her husband was Jerry Pfeffer. He's the one, they're the ones that got the IRS thing going, right? They He hired them a year or so before to start a new strategy towards the IRS, and that's when things started happening. And, you know, I, I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if DM had maneuvered legally to the point where Pat Broker couldn't do anything because he wasn't on any of the corporate documents, he wasn't on anything, and, um, you know, any, if he tried to take him to court, he would lose, you know? Mark, I agree with you completely. I, the more I investigate things on my on my ScientologyMoneyProject.com blog, mm -hmm. Jerry Pfeffer, who the late Jerry Pfeffer, who who worked for Williams and Connolly, the DC uh, you know power law firm. Right. As far as I can tell, he comes on the scene in 1984. Why? He comes on the scene because David Miscavige is being investigated by the IRS Criminal Investigation Correct. Division in in Los Angeles. And this rattles DM to the teeth, and you know it does. I know it does because Miscavige made statements to that, as did Jerry Pfeffer. Monique Yingling is married to Jerry Pfeffer. And I've used a term a long time in my writings, the Scientology shadow men. This nebulous group of people at the top, some in the church, but mostly outside the church. Mm -hmm. Curious fact here, the Scientology ex-lawyers, were hired because they were young, hungry lawyers. That's Lance, Lance Keller. Mm -hmm. Obviously, with Jerry Pfeffer's experience, he brings on Meade Emery. Meade's a former IRS assistant commissioner who has expertise. Mm -hmm. Meade's only consulting. Jerry Pfeffer, to me, is pulling the strings behind the scenes. Monique's out in front. Monique Yingling's out in front working with Dave. 
so that by uh, the late 80s, when they're lining up to get tax exemption in, into 91, Monique's very visible. She's Dave's face to the IRS. Right. For many meetings, you know, Dave and Marty are going back and forth to D.C. They're flying coach, carrying their own luggage, right? right. But Monique Yingling is there as a powerful D.C. attorney. Jerry's behind the scenes. Jerry Pfeffer had obviously gotten the IRS CID updates back in 84. I agree with you that uh, Gerald Pfeffer is very large and in charge behind the scenes, along with Monique Yingling. In fact, Mark, what is so very telling is that on the CNN History of Violence with Anderson Cooper, mm -hmm. and it, it's called the Sea Org Wives part, right? right? Where all the Sea Org Wives, I knew every square inch of his body and there were yes. no bruises. And I got to tell you, that is such a weird line, like a wife inspects your body at night. Right. Like, let me look all over your body. Right. Like, that's just kind of weird. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so Monique Yingling is there saying, because Anderson Cooper says, this is felonies. Why didn't you go to the police? And Monique says one of the most telling lines ever. We chose to handle it internally. Yes. And that's the history of Scientology in a nutshell of the Church of Scientology. Yeah. We chose to handle it internally. Mm -hmm. That says everything. Her words, Monique Ealing's words, are so revealing. They are revelatory mm -hmm. because what she's saying is we... We hid it. We covered it up. We chose to handle it internally. And you were one of the people at or near the top who were handling it internally. From where you stood at the top during that period of time where you were working as David Miscavige's assistant, would you say that is the Church of Scientology in a nutshell? We will handle it internally? Absolutely, because we're here to save the planet, clear the planet. We're superior beings. We're superior to everybody out there. They're just a bunch of wogs. They're trying to take us down. The government's trying to, to, to stop people from going up the bridge to total freedom. That's the viewpoint. That's, that's the mentality. So if we, if we have to break wog law, sweep things under the carpet, purge people. Hey, that's the great, greatest people. good for the greatest number of dynamics. Now, I'm not saying all Sea Org members and Scientologists think that, but at the top, I think that's thought. You know what I mean? I mean, I wouldn't have. I mean, as soon as, as, soon as you cross the line in terms of doing things illegal around me, I was out the door, you know? Um, so what, what caused you to leave the church? Well, when DM physically attacked me and assaulted me, I, that was it. I, I mean, that was, that was like, are you kidding me? I grew up in, I grew up in kindergarten. You never touch somebody like that. You know what I mean? You touch somebody, somebody hits you, you, you turn the other cheek and leave, you know? And I, I was more like, I don't care. Uh, I don't care if, if, if I have to wait till I'll run Harvard comes back. I'm not putting up with somebody putting his physically, putting his hands on me. And, and also denigrate the other denigration that was going on with the other staff at the base at the time where they were reading out their overts and withholds in front of the entire base. You know what I mean? Just human degradation, mental degradation. I was just, I will not put up with that, you know? What Can you tell our listeners the story of how David Miscavige assaulted you? Yeah, I mean, I've written this story up before, but basically, you know, towards the end of my, you know, when I was working for him as his assistant, uh, he went after... Uh, one way he goes after people is goes after finds the weak points and go out and goes after that. He went after my wife, who was who was an executive over the gold base and is a longtime messenger. My wife at the time, and she got sent to the rehabilitation project force for bogus no reason. And then even even the justice they didn't follow the policies that are laid out in order to be able to send somebody. Anyway, I completely disagreed. Again, just like when I got sent to the RPF before, where I disagreed, I'm disaffected, right? So I got removed from my position and put on mess, you know, labor work around the base, but not sent to the RPF. I was just put on labor work, and then I was being sec checked for months, uh, you know, do, you know, uh, confessionals giving off my crimes against David Miscavige and Shelley Miscavige and that type of thing. And it got to the point where, you know, I I, I started making up stuff because you know you, you knew what they wanted to hear. I mean, I've been around Shelley and DM so long that I knew they didn't want to hear about you know some little itty bitty thing. They wanted to hear about your evil intention to stop something that they were doing or whatever. You know what I mean? So you start making stuff up because then they feel like, oh, finally he's coming clean, you know. And then for we can put him back on his post, you know. So that's what happened to me is that um, I I, uh, I got put back on my post for literally two weeks, and there was an audio line, there was an audio production line that Mark Headley actually was brought up. He was only 16 at the time, and we only overlapped it by about a month, but he was working on it at the time, too. There was an audio production line that David Miscavige shut down because it was 
producing bad quality cassette tapes, and it was complete trash. It was completely ridiculous, is what I mean. Anyway, to make a long story short, they couldn't get. We were working around the clock for weeks, and they couldn't get it done. Um, I went down to my um, my um, ex-wife, my wife's brother's wedding. We went down. We got permission to go to San Diego, and I took her from the RPF, and we went down to San Diego to the wedding. And while I was down there, I got paged by Shelley that DM was coming back from the ship. He was he had been in, at the free winds. He was on his way back, and that the the production line was still not handled. And it was going to be a big flap, big. So on the drive home, I'm thinking, you know, I'm just, I want to be with my wife when we get out of here. Anyway, I ended up blowing. I blew that night. I'm not going to go into all the details because it's a long story. But basically, I blew, came back to the base with the intention of going to the RPF. But no, no, once he found out I wanted to go to the RPF, that was too good for me. So I was, I was put on the grounds pulling weeds. And, uh, and then I started coming around again. Then I blew again a second time after the flood, the big flood, right? And yes. uh, the flood happened, and I saw that he was nuts. And uh, I came back. I got I got um, I got uh, recaptured at my sister's house, who was a Scientologist at the time. They came and grabbed me and brought me back. And then finally, that that happened. I was up painting pipes in the uh, garage at the time, up on a scissors lift. And he came walking through, and and he had heard that I wanted to stay. And he said, "You, I hear you want to stay." And I said, "No, sir, I still want to leave." And he said, "Why do you want to leave?" And I said, "Freedom." And he said, you're a bypass case, which is, which in Scientology terms means Scientology processing hasn't worked on you and that you are, you're completely nuts. You know what I mean? I said, no, you don't understand, sir. I'm talking about freedom to choose and do what I want to do, say what I want to say, that type of freedom. At that point, he ordered me down off the scissors list and came over and grabbed me around the throat, started kicking and punching me, pulling on my hair. I went down on the ground, covered up in a fetal position just because I didn't, I wasn't going to fight back. I wanted the people around him to see, because he was with his entourage, what a nutcase he was. Because at that point in time, I actually was thinking about going after DM. If I ended up leaving Scientology and had to sue, I was going to sue him, not Scientology. And, um, you know, he just continued and he finally stopped. I stood up, I reached behind my head. My, my hand was bloody. I said, you made my head bleed. And he goes, oh, well, it was all for your own good. And then I pointed my finger at him. I said, you notice I didn't lay one finger on you. And at that point, he started going like, oh, well, you know, it's for your own good, and I'll get the medical officer down here to take a look at you, and he scurried off. But um, that that was when I went, that's enough. I'm, I just, my next chance to leave, I'm going to leave. Because I, I, I kept coming back because I wanted to get my wife to come with me, but they had turned her against me, and she wouldn't even speak mm -hmm. to me. You know what I mean? So um, we'd been married six years, never had a problem, and all of a sudden she won't even speak to me. And so after that happened, then, then I finally decided, okay, the next chance I get to leave, I'm out. And that's when I left on September 15, 1990. I actually left, went to a motel, telephoned the base saying, if you don't give me my stuff in my car, I'm going to the Hemet police, and I'll be there about 2 o'clock this afternoon. And that's when they got serious and they gave me everything. You know, that is an... I Yet another story of good people doing something they believe in. And this is one of the contradictions of David Miscavige. He needs good, strong people to get things done for the church, right? Mm -hmm. But the very people upon whom his power depends upon, he will destroy. Right. Just like L. Ron Hubbard. Exactly. I was going to just make that point, too. I realized that after the fact. I don't know if it's paranoid schizophrenia, whatever the psychological term is, you know what I mean? But they see enemies behind every tree. What I would say, the very position at the head of the Church of Scientology will make you crazy. It seems like that kind of unchecked power where nobody can say, hey, uh, Mr. Hubbard or Mr. Miscavige, maybe you should rethink this. Mm -hmm. Nobody can challenge them. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems when you have, uh, and it is true, uh, the maxim, you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Right. When you have that kind of unchecked power and money, you become uh, Caligula. You just become insane. And on top of it, you do become paranoid because the more vicious things you do to people, the more you know you have that many more enemies. Right, exactly so right. It's, it's, like, it's almost like you commit so many crimes against people to the point where you can no longer confront them and be around them because you know they know you've done bad. I always tell people, I have, you know, I'm, I left around the same time several senior messengers, several, several senior Scientology messengers who grew up with L. Ron Hubbard left, and then we relocated to Las Vegas, and we were friends. We've been friends all the same. We sat around and talked and went, 
if we walked into a room right now, today, to this day, with David Miscavige by himself, without an entourage, he would not be able to confront us because he knows we can call him on the carpet on so many things that he was supposed to do and the way he was supposed to act and the way things were supposed to be run, and he didn't do it. Do you know what I mean? And he would want to bolt the room. He wouldn't stay. He, he couldn't confront it. Of course he would run away. And Mark Fisher, thank you for being our guest today. Okay. I'd like to have you back to talk about your post uh Sea Org years where David Miscavige sends in a spy to you and your friends in Las Vegas. Okay. Be happy to that's do a, Oh, that's a story in and of itself. We look forward to it. For Surviving Scientology Radio, this is Jeffrey Augustine. Thank